Hi there guys, welcome back to Pop Map Chem and in this lesson we're going to be starting a new unit that's unit 7 and 17 equilibria. In the first lesson we're going to be looking at dynamic equilibria. Just a reminder to comment if you've got any suggestions below, please like, subscribe and hit the bell icon and obviously share this YouTube channel and our other channels Pop Em Up Food and Pop Em Up Life with anyone. Uh, I will be including links and timestamps in the description right let's have a look at what we're going to do today basically we're going to introduce this term dynamic equilibrium which is going to be obviously key to in understanding the rest of this unit we're going to describe how we can find the expression for the equilibrium constant for each given reaction and we're going to try and evaluate the relationship between equilibrium constant and the reaction quotient so what are equilibria? Well, throughout the course so far and traditionally, we think of chemical reactions as a transformation from A plus B to C. And this arrow that we usually put between them represents the change of all of one to the other. At the bottom, I've also got this diagram to show you there that traditionally we expect A plus B all goes to C. I mean, that was one of the assumptions we used for a lot of our calculations in the first unit. Now, an equilibria stops, if you like, halfway through. That means we do not get that complete transformation as we expected before. Understanding the extent to which a reaction occurs helps us build a full picture of the reaction. We've already done what occurs, what energy transfer happens and how fast it is. Now, with this extent, we're going to complete that picture of the reaction and we're going to be able to describe that. So whereas we thought these as 100% before, an equilibrium can fit from anywhere to 50 all the way along a sliding scale from 0 to 100. First things first then, how do we write these? Well, we use this equilibrium sign, which you may have seen before or may not. Now, this is characterized by one half arrow going one way and one half arrow going the other way on top of each other. We do not put two full arrows going in either direction. It's going to be one half arrow and another half arrow going in the other direction. Now we just sometimes describe the forward reaction as the reaction going from left to right, going from the reactants to the products and the backwards reaction going from the product to the reactants. Obviously nature doesn't understand these differences but this is how we describe them for our purposes or if you like the right hand side and the left hand side so you could say the right hand moving to the right hand side is going forward and moving to the left hand side is going backward next let's have a look at what criteria a system has if it's at dynamic equilibrium so there are three criteria that a system needs the first of those is that the system must be closed okay nothing can come in or out otherwise we're going to disrupt it's not going to be an equilibrium it's just going to be a system changing the second is that the rate of the forward reaction is the rate of the backwards reaction it's important to remember this is not zero this doesn't mean the reactions actually stopped it just means we've got to a point at which one going in one direction and the reaction going in the other direction are the same lastly we have that the products and the reactants concentration remain constant. That's not to say they're the same. They can, they can be the same, but they usually will not be the same. It just means that they're not changing because the system has reached the point of equilibrium. Now, we have to bear in mind that this is not like a physical equilibrium. You may be used to understanding kind of a balancing act, like if they're seesaw, we would expect that the person that's lower down they have a larger downward force than the person on the right and so we could say that f1 is larger than f2 if we were looking at forces however when we're looking at dynamic equilibrium it's not the same and the reason for that is is because we constantly have a backwards and forwards reaction still occurring this is not a static system it's a dynamic system so we want to differentiate it from those uh, physical systems and remember that it's slightly different. So in a reaction like A plus B goes forwards and backwards to C, we do have A plus B turning into C and vice versa. 
but they are continually doing that they are not it's not a static system so we actually have a difference between what's happening on a microscopic level and a macroscopic level okay on a microscopic level so we still have changes occurring whereas on a macroscopic scale it may seem initially similar to the seesaw example because we don't have changes on a macroscopic level now that we've defined our equilibrium let's move on to the equilibrium constant so the equilibrium constant is something that tells us about the position of the equilibrium and where that equilibrium lies and we can use this overall equation kc is equal to the concentration of the products divided by the concentration of the reactants to find it so as we can see from that equation we can see that if the product is very very large if that's a very very large number then our overall value is going to be greater than one and so a value of one or greater for kc indicates that we have a reaction where the products are favored whereas if we look at the equation and we see if the reactants was a very large number the denominator then that would bring our number below one so a number below one indicates that our reactants are favored obviously we can't get a value less than zero for this equation and technically we can have an infinite value uh, which would be our maximum so let's draw a generalized example of this so let's take an equation a plus b goes to c plus d where the capital letters are the components and the lowercase letters are the stoichiometric coefficients looking at the generalized equation for kc we can see products over reactants so we can see our products are c and d and our reactants are a plus b so we should be able to just write one over the other right well it's not quite that simple we need to do kc equals the concentration square brackets is concentration remember of c times d now what we need to do is we need to take into consideration the stoichiometric coefficients. So we do these each concentration to the power of the stoichiometric coefficients, uh, unlike what we did back in the rate equations. Now, then we just do the same, which is A times B, both to the power of their stoichiometric coefficients, gives us the overall equilibrium constant. So let's give ourselves an overview of what this expression looks like and the components so kc stands for equilibrium constant as i've said and the c stands for it being in concentration yeah, it doesn't stand for constant it means that we have the equilibrium constant in terms of concentration we then have our squared brackets which you remember refers to the moles per decimeter it refers to the concentration of the component inside the square brackets the indices that each of the numbers is to uh, in the square brackets is the number in front of that species in the balanced chemical equation so that's the stoichiometric coefficient and of course like we said before we've got products on the top and reactants on the bottom so how does this compare to what we call the reaction quotient well the good news is the reaction quotient fundamentally is calculated in exactly the same way as kc still concentration of products divided by the concentration of the reactants the only difference is is that so if we have a look at the uh, reaction rate time graph over here any time before the concentration stay constant any time before that we would say we could calculate q at any of those points any time after that point we would be calculating kc now again we're still calculating this with exactly the same calculation but anything in this graph to the left is going to be our q and anything to the right is kc so comparing these values indicates which way the reaction will shift using the same calculation concentration of products over concentration of the reactants and then comparing those overall values and comparing the relative value of q and k 
is going to tell us whether the reaction wants to move towards giving us more products or wants to move towards giving us more reactants. So let's have a little go at doing that and comparing these. Let's take our graph, get two positions on it. So we'll arbitrarily, we'll just pick this position where the two lines cross, but it could be any point where the rates aren't constant and a point after the rates stay constant and calculate both Q and KC. So once again, we're gonna use concentration of products over concentration of reactants. I'm just gonna label this graph up on the left-hand side, just simply one, two, three, four, just to give us some easy values to calculate with. Plugging in our values then for Q, we've got 2.5 divided by 2.5, which is of course one. And for our value of KC, we have three divided by two, which is 1.5. And so in this case, we can see that KC is larger than Q. So we could talk about the implications of this. Now in our situation where we had Q being smaller than K, the reaction is favoring the products. Okay, the ratio of the products to reactants is less than that of the system of equilibrium. So the concentration of the product wants to be higher, okay? Because remember, if we have A plus B goes to, to make C, then we're gonna have C over A times B. And so we're going to shift to the right-hand side to increase the value as we get towards K. So if Q is smaller than K, it's gonna shift to the right-hand side. Whereas if we have Q being larger than K, that must mean that the right-hand side is larger than it should be. And so the reaction is going to shift towards the left-hand side, the reactants. So Q being larger, we shift to the left. And of course, if they're equal, then Q is K by definition. So they're just the same. We don't, we don't need to consider that. So let me use my exceptional artistic ability to draw us an example of a liquid vapor equilibrium. So we'll pick a glass and we fill that glass with water. Now you may already know if you leave a glass around, what's gonna happen to the water inside? Well, you know, if we leave it for a certain period of time, it's going to evaporate. So all we're saying is that some of the water has been lost to the surroundings. Now, that evaporation occurs and the loss occurs, which is why we have less in the second beaker, because at the surface of the water, there is a liquid vapor equilibrium. That means water going from liquid to gas. And of course, backwards to liquid. However, because the gas keeps dispersing into the surrounding environment, this is not a closed system. And so over time, we lose more and more water as that vapor disperses so obviously if we put a lid on this we would lose less water because the system will be closed and be more a typical equilibrium this loss of gas this transition this interface is what we call vapor pressure and that's the pressure that any liquid causes as a gas on its surroundings indeed if we can increase or go above this vapor pressure that is the point at which we will get the liquid to boil and that's why and that doesn't just happen in the surface of the liquid that actually happens inside the liquid that's why if you've ever boiled water you'll notice it's bubbling because it's gone above its vapor pressure and so bubbles of vapor are forming inside the liquid also in summary then molecules at the near the surface of the liquid are able to gain energy, break free and become a vapor. If we seal that container, we end up with that liquid water vapor equilibrium. And that vapor exerts pressure on the surroundings. And we call that the vapor pressure. Okay, let's do some questions to check. Wait for the bottom up. First question then, write the expression for KC for this reaction. Pause it here to give yourself some time. Pop them up. 
So remembering our expression for KC is just our concentration of our products divided by our concentration of our reactants. So here our products is the CUSO4.5H2O. So we're gonna do the concentration of CUSO4.5H2O divided by the concentration of CUSO4 multiplied by the concentration of water to the power five. Now, if that's the answer you got, you'd be completely correct and you can write that in an exam. However, if we look at H2O to the power five, concentration is given in moles per decimeter and we obviously want to think decimeters of what? Now, that's water if it's aqueous. So usually the concentration of water is given as one and then for any pure liquid, it would be the same. And so therefore we don't usually include this in the equilibrium constant. However, if you include it, you will not lose any marks and your expression is still correct. Okay, brilliant, time to try the next one. So here we want you to write the KC expression for the complete combustion of methane. Now you're gonna have to write a balanced equation to get this one right. Pause the video here to give yourself some time. Okay guys, pop them up. Now with this question, obviously first thing we need to do is balance the equation. So we know for any complete combustion, react with oxygen gives us CO2 and H2O. We've got carbons already balanced, four hydrogens on one side. So we're gonna need to put two in front of our hydrogens there, which gives us four oxygen. So we balance that with two oxygen over there. Kc is products divided by reactants. So we're going to do our products, which is CO2 times H2O all squared, because look at the balanced equation, divided by CH4 multiplied by O2, also all squared due to the balanced equation. Nice work there, guys. So just to recap that really quickly, we have a dynamic equilibrium which the concentrations of reactants and products stays constant the rate of the forward reaction equals the rate of backwards reaction in a closed system and we write our kc by doing our products concentration of our products divided by our concentration of our reactants with large values of kc indicating that the products are favored and very low values of kc indicating that the reactants are favored. Make sure you do some questions on this so that you're really competent at writing the expression for KC for a reaction you're given. Thanks again for joining me, guys. Remember to comment below to suggest new content, like, subscribe, and hit the bell icon, and please share the video and the channel. Also, check out our other channels, Pop Em Up Food and Pop Em Up Life for some alternative content. And remember, Practice makes slightly better.